fathers and their children, there's probably not another relationship you'll ever have in your life more important than your relationship with your father. Now, in our day and age, it's hard to preach these sermons. It's hard because so many people grow up today in broken homes. So many people do not have a large collection of fond memories of their dad. And, uh, and, and some, of us, some of us do. Some of us are, are blessed with an opportunity to, to be able to share many, 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 many memories of, 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 of dad loving you and taking care of you and teaching you and all that kind of stuff. But there are some of you here who grew up with uh, an absentee dad or with no, no father figure in the home or with a father figure where he just didn't really understand what being a father was all about and some people were abused. And I tell you, we have a lot of problems these days. And one of the reasons we have so many of these problems, I'm going to touch on in just a moment. But the fact that a lot of people have complicated relationships with their father is not a reason not to preach on the importance of fatherhood. And it's certainly not a reason to, to, to not preach on it in a crowd like this because we got a lot of fathers here. And most of you here have fond memories of your father. And if you don't have a lot of fond memories of your father, my advice to you is to pick the three or four or five or ten that you have and decorate your heart with those. Don't decorate your heart with dark pictures of negative things, you know. Decorate your heart with the good pictures, the good memories that God gave you. But more on that at another time. Right now I want to talk about the importance of the father-child relationship. Probably no other relationship is more important in your life. Even those of us whose father has gone on, he still plays a prominent role in my life. It's weird how many times my dad instructs me now, even though he's buried over there on Forest Lawn in the Cerritos or some town over there. Isn't that weird? Some of you understand, I can see some heads not you. You know what I mean. Some of you whose father has gone on, you know that something, just the memory of things he's taught you, things he's said, just knowing his mind, his way, guides you and directs you in, in your life right now. And uh, I'm seeking my dad's counsel right now on my car. <laughs> but I'm not going to have a seance. <laughs> or go to, a, go to a Jonathan, whoever he is, that talks to the dead the other side, that crackpot. But I will draw from memories and from things he's taught me and things he said and try to, you know, the point is, your dad is going to be with you the rest of your life, even after he dies. He's still with you in the sense that whatever he's taught you, whatever impress he's made upon your heart or imprint he's made upon your life is still going to have, be a factor in the way you live your life and so on. And so it's very important to work out your relationship with your father, even if he's already dead. And you know the best way to work out conflicts and problems you might have in your relationship with your earthly father is to get your relationship with your heavenly father squared away. Now, I'm serious. If you get your relationship with your heavenly father squared away, that by itself will do more than any other single thing to help you resolve issues with your earthly father. I'm glad we have a heavenly father. You know, for many years it was assumed fathers were relatively unimportant to child nurturing. In the aftermath of our court's decision to liberalize divorce laws, which, by the way, began the destruction of the home in this country. And there's another issue, another hot-button issue. Divorce is, is like so common today and, and so generally accepted by everybody today, it's complicated you know, it, it, it creates a lot of issues for preachers where when they're trying to preach on something, they have to stop and give all these caveats out there because there's always somebody who will say, yeah, but this guy was, was uh, you know, coming uh, into the bedroom at night with a knife over my head. And what do you expect me not to divorce a guy like that? And we have that kind of stuff. I'm not, look, please, 
don't go there. I'm not talking about the husband that's trying to kill his family. You probably ought to get out of there about as fast as you can. I'm not talking about that. And then we can get into all the other issues about adultery and all this kind of stuff. Let me tell you something. It's like this abortion thing. They always point out these bizarre, strange things that probably never happen, or if they happen, they happen once every 500,000 kids they kill. Right? And they focus on that one thing. But what about the other 500,000 kids they've killed? You know what I mean? 99% of divorces happen because people are too immature to work out their relationship problems. That's, that's what most divorce is about. And I, I could preach that sermon on this stupidity of falling in love. Falling in love is about as smart as me falling off of this platform. It's just dumb. And about, and about as effective. No, you plant your heart where it needs to be. You pay attention to where you put it and all this kind of stuff. But I don't have time to preach that sermon. The point is... Um, most divorces are, are about petty, silly, infantile, immature people who get all wrapped up in themselves and, and just can't see past their own nose and recognize that marriage is work. It takes work to make a relationship work doesn't happen all by itself. It isn't just some magical thing. There isn't somebody that's your soulmate. And you're just trying to find them. Oh, I found my soulmate. I don't know how many divorces uh, that, that, that I've had to deal with in the course of my ministry who were soulmates. It's just nonsense. And the Hollywood pumps you full of this junk and it's foolishness. The truth is marriage takes work. And, uh, and, and I've said it many times, the, the number one thing, the, the number one thing that will keep a marriage together is the character of the people who are married. When you get done with it, at the bottom line, it's as simple as this. Do you have the character to keep your commitments? Or are you of such a low character that when things get a little tough, you violate your vows? It comes down to character. Back in the day, when God's law that says what man has, or what God has joined together, let not man put asunder, when that was the prevailing principle, when that was what guided the conscience of the nation, when that was the rule, well, we had a much better situation in this country. But when Certain judges decided to make themselves God and arrogate to themselves the power to cut asunder what God joined together. Then marriage began falling apart in this country. What God joins together, let not man put asunder. Man has no business granting a divorce. But no, 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 I've got that off my chest. In the aftermath of the court's decision to liberalize divorce laws, creating an environment where the, the most sacred contract between people, marriage, is now the most trivialized and most disregarded contract. You can't get out of a contract to buy your car as easy as you can get out of a contract to be married. And I'm going to ask you right now, what's the most important contract? Buying a car or being married? Huh? You try to get a divorce from your mortgage. <laughs> Go ahead. See where, you, see where that lands you. It's amazing, isn't it, how we have come to disregard with such disdain and such disrespect 
the number one most important contract between human beings. The contract sealed with vows in marriage. Before sanctity of marriage was flushed into the sewer by judges who arrogated themselves the role of God in this country, we understood the importance of father and mother in the home. The model you saw presented publicly always was mother and father. But you know, when they began taking to themselves the power to cut asunder what God joined together, they began to suggest to us, you go back in your history and you'll see this, they began to popularize the notion that, well, mother is the one that's really important in nurture. Dad's not so important. And without saying it in so many words, and in some cases they would say it in so many words, but without necessarily spelling that out, the impression that was left upon the public was the idea that, that, that the mother is the more important one for nurturing the children. And then they began promoting the idea of single parenting and suggesting that it really didn't hurt the children too much. It really wasn't so much of a problem. But it's a huge problem. And those who have experienced it know they're the loudest ones to say amen. You know, really. It's a huge problem. And it, 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 you know, there are all kinds of practical logistical reasons that when a divorce does occur or when, when you have single parenting going on, it's the mother who does it. There are a lot of logical kinds of logistical sort of things that have all to do with the physical part of the whole thing. But there are some serious issues that develop in a child's life if the child grows up without a father, without an active father participating in their life. And they began to study this thing and began to realize, you know what? Dad's important. There's one research, one researcher that put together a, a, a catalog of all these different studies. I don't remember the number of studies. It was several. 20, 30 different studies on this question. The impact of absentee fathers in the home. And here's what they said. Quote, we... What we find surprising and new is that a father's love is turning out to be just as important as, sometimes more important than, mother's love. Shazam! <laughs> what a surprise! This thing God created, a man shall leave his mother and father, cleave to his wife, and those two shall become one flesh, and Procreate, bring forth children, creating a family. How astounding it is that the father's important. It's amazing how stupid we are. How foolish we become when we depart from God. Rohner, a professor emeritus at the University of Connecticut, noticed that, quote, fathers are cited more than mothers in issues such as psychological maladjustment, substance abuse, depression, and conduct problems, end quote. The same researcher, Rohner, also noted that, quote, father love sometimes explains a unique independent portion of the variance in specific child outcomes over and above the portion of variance explained by mother love. And these guys use language that sometimes is like, why do you bother talking like that? Just tell us what you really mean. But basically what he's saying is, we've discovered something that's new and surprising. Fathers are actually important. <laughs> oh man, in fact, according to these researchers, sometimes, and in many cases, the impact the father has on the life of the child far outweighs the impact the mothers have upon the child. This is not to say the mothers aren't important. Of course they are. But you already know that they are. What's happened in our culture, though, is there's this, this growing idea that fathers are they just go make the money, bring home the, the food and whatever, and then turn it all over to the mother. That's not true. Dad needs to be very much involved in the nurturing part of 
rearing children. It's very important. 